Okay, so how often do we get to manhandle the motors of the cars we drive in the show? Like, never, and this is like the whole thing. This is the electric motor, this is the transaxle, and this is the air conditioning compressor. So the motor, 109 horsepower, 210 pound-feet of torque. The half shafts come out of here, and then all of the charging and all that kind of stuff connects here. So, let's put that aside, continue to manhandle the motor, and get to driving. So interesting update on the overall EV market. Uh, I didn't know this, but the sales of EVs were up 29% last year. Now, that is a bit of a misleading number, though, because 44% of the total sales were in one state. Uh, I'll let you take a wild guess as to what state that was, which brings up the point, where is this car going to be sold? And it's going to be sold in all the usual tree-hugging, uh, left of center states like California, New York, Oregon, that kind of place. And you'll start to see it cascade in other places like, you know, there's obviously the pockets of Austin, maybe Atlanta, um, but that's about the total list of where these cars are going to be sold. So what about the battery? It's a 27 kilowatt hour, 360 volt lithium ion polymer battery, and it's driven by 192 of these cells. Inside this cell, on the cathode side uh, is a material called nickel cobalt manganese. On the anode side, it's a carbon graphite material. And inside this entire cell is a special gel electrolyte. And this is good for durability, for extending or maximizing the range of the car, and thermal stability, and distance to empty stability. That's really, really important in an EV because you don't want to drive around and see, oh my God, you got 30 miles, no way, it's 50 miles, oh wait, no, it's 70 miles. So that originates from these cells. Inside the battery, you've got eight modules. We have voltage sensing lines, and if the battery management system senses anything, it will immediately cut voltage to the battery pack entirely. Now another safety aspect is this circuit breaker right here. And this actually pokes through, it's, it's, it's available uh, through the floor of the car, inside the car. So if there was an accident, an emergency responder would know to go to a certain location. It's just in front of the back seat, right behind the center console, and he can pull this circuit breaker right out and it shuts the whole pack down. So let's get this out of the way immediately. Uh, the range is 93 miles. Now I started the day and it was indicated at 101 miles. The 93 is what's EPA certified. And so far I've put about 40 miles on the car and it says I've got 37 miles of range. Okay, that's all fine and good, but how does it actually drive when you're trying to get 93 plus miles out of the range? I can't sit here and tell you that the car's a slouch. It gets off the line okay, it's got plenty of torque, um, but is it some sort of like fire-breathing E63 station wagon kind of monster, uh, this ain't your vehicle. I would argue EVs are way more than propulsion systems, efficiency, or impact on the environment. I would say just as important in the equation is packaging. So there's the obvious question of where are the batteries packaged here? In this case, the batteries sit on this like sled kind of thing that go from here to here and sit underneath the passenger compartment, which has a huge benefit. Basically, the storage compartment has no penalty in the transition from internal combustion engine to EV. Now, you and I usually have a discussion back and forth. Uh, I ask you guys questions, and I look for your answers in the comments below or via our social networks. But today, we're going to try something a bit different. I'm going to ask you two questions in one episode. So let's start with the first question. Now, if you look at most like funky EVs, like Leaves or a plug-in hybrid like a, like a Volt, they look different and they're trying to stand out. Uh, but this, this is kind of like the Brooklyn of the EV world. This is like the hipster EV, but it still looks like kind of a normal car. So my question to you is, what would motivate you to purchase an EV? Does it need to look like a spaceship? Or does it need to look like something that would be at home in Fort Greene? Whatever your choice, hit me up in the comments below or via our social networks, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And make sure you stay tuned to the end of the episode for question number two. 
Normal cars use the heat from the internal combustion engine to heat the cabin of the car, but EVs don't have internal combustion engines, so they gotta find heat somewhere else. Well, this car uses a heat pump based HVAC system. Well, how does that work? Well, it has an air conditioning compressor and refrigerant, and when you wanna cool the cabin, you run it like an air conditioning system, and when you wanna heat the cabin, you actually reverse the flow of that refrigerant. And what's cool about this car is it brings in heat from the electric motor and heat from the power electronics, which are liquid cooled, and it incorporates the heat into the heat pump system to heat the cabin when you want heat. So what do you get out of it? You get a heating system that's 27% more efficient than a traditional PTC heater that's in a lot of other EVs. Think about this scenario. Uh, there's no one else in the car with me, and most people are in that scenario when they're driving to work. So. Let's say for the sake of discussion, I want to run the air conditioner, which I'm doing right now. It's like 87 degrees out right now. Um, I can put on this driver only mode and the fan and the HVAC system will focus just on the portion in front of the driver. Now the theory of an EV is to lower one's reliance on petroleum. Uh, in reality, that usually stops somewhere aft of the firewall. Uh, not really the case here. Do you guys remember when we drove that Nissan Leaf I poured out a recycling bin full of plastic water bottles, and that was to demonstrate that the carpeting in the Nissan LEAF is made from recycled plastic water bottles. Well, the Kia folks, they don't want to be outdone by the Nissan folks. So they've gone a bit of a step further, and they've gone the bio route as well, but in this case, they're using corn and sugar to create the material for the A-pillar the headliner, the console, and not to be outdone by the Nissan LEAF, the carpeting. So like most EVs, there's a regen mode here. Did you guys see our Volkswagen e-Golf film? Uh, in that car, there are three modes of regen. Basically, like salsas, there's different versions. There's a, there's a, a mild salsa of regen. There's a medium salsa version of regen, and there's like a super hot salsa version of regen. Uh, this one only has one version of regen. Basically, you go from the D, and then you go to a B. So what am I doing? I'm doing, what, 46 miles an hour, and I'm driving 40, 45 miles an hour, and I'm driving around a suburban area, generally. So there's a stop sign coming up here. So let's try, let's go down to 35 miles an hour, 38. 37, 36, okay, 35, I see the stop sign. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna let the regen stop the car. Okay, so 35 miles an hour, and let's try a different seating position. Okay, we're down to 22, 15, 11, 9, 7, 6, 5. We still have not gotten to the stop line yet. Two, 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 and before we hit this traffic coming here, Let's stop coasting. So the car would coast, but it came almost to a full stop in the regen mode. So a Tesla Model S has an energy density somewhere north of 240 watt hours per kilogram. This battery is at 200 watt hours per kilogram. And anecdotally, all of this energy in here is the equivalent of eight tenths of a gallon of gasoline in terms of energy equivalent. So the folks at Kia say that the EV version of the Soul has more torsional rigidity to it, and it would stand to reason because a car that has more weight in it, you know, the batteries, uh, it would need a stronger structure. Uh, and you would think that would have an impact on the handling of the vehicle. And there isn't a hell of a lot of lean when you consider there's so many batteries underneath there. Let's go around another turn here. And it's kind of composed. You feel the extra weight of the car. There's no doubt about that, but you don't feel as if you're top heavy. You don't feel like, oh my God, I'm going to tip over because the center of gravity is so high. And that's really what we've come to expect with a lot of hybrids or, or, or full on electric cars, because by virtue of the fact of packaging two propulsion systems or extra batteries, it doesn't have the same lower center of gravity as a gas car uh, of the same size. So I promised you guys a second question in this film. And before we get to that, we have to celebrate an anniversary. Kia has been in the US for 20 years, believe it or not. Uh, they started back in 1994 with the Safia and the Sportage. But if we're really being honest with one another, the car guys, Kia's never been their first choice. And uh, really car buyers, there's still a perception problem. 
But if you look at all like initial quality study surveys, all that kind of stuff, Kia actually ranks kind of high. So why is there still a perception problem? Which brings me to my question for you guys. Would you buy a Kia, especially now that there's an EV out here, would you buy a Kia and why or why not? Let me know in the comments below or hit us up via our social networks, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll see you guys next time. So click here to watch one of our 250 other episodes. Click here to subscribe. And can we ask you guys a favor? Can you watch these within the first 36 hours? Because it gets us more views, which gets us more dollars, which gets you more episodes. And of course, follow us, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll see you guys next time.